chin wag. <laughs> Chin, chin wag. Chin's a wagon. Chins, Chins are, are wagging wagon. all across the nation. People still ask me, what does it mean? And I just kind of say, people, get out there and convert people to get the Get out there. Just tune in, people, and you'll understand. <laughs> I was actually amazed at how uncommon it seems to be to people. Yeah. I, I guess I'm weird because I we knew what it was, but I didn't. I thought maybe it was a more common phrase in America, but it's not. It's very. It's British. good for people to adopt new vocabulary terms, really and so is. let's let's try to make it stick. I yeah. think we should try as much as we can to get people to adopt Britishisms. I'm going to call <laughs> the windshield in my car the windscreen on my the car from screen. now on, and, and the, the boot next of time, your car. yes, and the boot <laughs> of my car. And the next time I want a wrench from you, Steve, I'm going to ask you to hand me a spanner. All right. <laughs> yes. That's, yes. Wait, will and I then, get that from my gay raj? <laughs> is it gay raj? Is that yeah. a, they say gay raj? Yes. And then I'll wrap it up in aluminium, <laughs> which is the, yep, aluminium. And then we'll drive the lorry to. Uh, oh, man. Uh, here we yeah, go. Lorry. Here we go. The pavement. They don't say sidewalk. And then trousers. We'll have our trousers. <laughs> we'll have our trousers, of course. Uh, what else is there? There's a lot of other... Oh, so many. My favorite thing they do is the whole... Do you ever see the the name Chalmondale? It's, it's, that's how it's spelled. C-H-O-L-M-O-N. It's a Chalmondale is the word, but they pronounce it Chumley. What is it? Like... It's a name. Chalmondale. It's a, Yeah, it's some oh. sort of name, and it's like, but they pronounce it Chumley. There's a hilarious line that... Um, that George Orwell says, he's making fun of, you know, he's great at making fun of everybody, but including his own British uh, compatriots. And he says, um, British men refuse to uh, pronounce French words properly, lest it th their sexuality be called into question. So they mispronounce it <laughs> they all. They intentionally in this, like, ridiculous mispronounce way. it. Yes, so they'll be yeah. macho. And, it's really, yeah, yeah, really yeah, funny. Yeah, well, that makes sense in some ways. I could see guys doing that. So you don't yeah. want to look any foreign language. You don't want to look like you know some foreign yeah. language. Well, uh, Speaking of that, uh, sp speaking of that, speaking of what? That was not a good transition. <laughs> speaking of what? Uh, it doesn't, doesn't speaking, matter. <laughs> apropos of nothing, we're going to, uh, we, we're back with some from listener mail is what we're doing here. And I think we have, we have one to read, uh, Steve, that I believe yeah. you were going to read for us. We have uh, an interesting letter here. Yes, take it away. Rick, Rick B. Mm -hmm. Um, as I think listeners, longtime listeners know of this show, we are interested very much in matters of uh, alien intelligence and alien existence. And uh, Rick B. Uh, writes in saying, uh, I'm wondering if you guys have ever heard of the Drake equation. I have not. Uh, and uh, that is actually, that is a very interesting thing. I looked it up after reading Rick's uh, letter. Mm -hmm. Um it's SETI inspired. And so I should just define what SETI is. I think a lot of our listeners might know. It means the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And this was mm -hmm. a group that um, Carl Sagan was a part of back right. in the day. Right. And, does, it still, um, still does it still exist? It's, I believe it still exists, but it's yeah. probably been shrunken down to a basement somewhere. <laughs> it's it's a in a NASA It's like on a st stuff. strip mall in Orlando yeah. somewhere. Yeah. Just with, right. with an old <laughs> the tin can <laughs> and a string. <laughs> Oh, dear. <laughs> Poor guy. It's in a basement of a Denny's or something. <laughs> okay, so he says, it's a SETI-inspired probabilistic argument used to estimate the number of active, communicative, extraterrestrial civilizations in the Milky Way. Mm -hmm. And he says, the part I thought you might have fun with, fun might not be the right word, uh, is the L in the equation. And L stands for the number of years an intelligent civilization remains detectable. Hmm. So... Um, let me quickly say what the Drake equation is, and then I'm going to yeah. finish his letter because it'll okay. make more sense if I can say what it is. Okay. It's basically a, a, an equation developed by a guy named Frank Drake in 1961. That sounds like a fake name. That sounds like I know, a pseudonym. But it, he's real. Uh, Frank Drake. Frank Drake. <laughs> <laughs> it does sound like a from central Just casting. Um, on the fly, making up a name. <laughs> yes. He says, okay, N is the number we're trying to arrive at. And N is basically the number of civilizations in the Milky Way galaxy with which communication might be possible. So this is just like how many places have intelligent alien life that we okay. could talk to. Okay. And he says it's a function of all these variables. And the variables, it's a long list here, but it's you'll understand it right away. It just says you have to say 
that number is basically the average rate of star formation in our galaxy times mm -hmm. the fraction of those stars that have planets mm -hmm. times the average number of planets that can potentially support life mm -hmm. times the fraction of planets that could support life that actually develop life mm -hmm. times the fraction of planets that life go on to develop intelligent life, because that's mm -hmm. obviously a big difference, right. times the fraction of civilizations that develop a technology times the length of time for which civilizations release detectable signals into space. So that okay. last one is L. Mm -hmm. That means in order for us to contact another alien civilization, they have to be broadcasting some signals that they're out there. Mm -hmm. And so the question is how long could a civilization broadcast its presence through technology? Mm -hmm. And so until they do themselves in exactly, uh -huh. yeah, okay, there's, or it's gonna something be a does them in, or yes, right, okay, or they're done in, right, okay, uh huh. So then Rick says, uh, We are the only intelligent civilization we know of, and we don't know how long we will remain detectable. A conservative estimate for this value would be 50 years based on our own experience to date. Huh. Drake felt that 10,000 years was a good guess, but that was in 1961. I believe we're talking mm. about the end of our civilization here. So mm -hmm. here's, the, here's the fun part. He says, mm. what do you think would be some of the factors we would employ to quantify it? Some likely candidates might be climate change, mm -hmm. the rise of technology, specifically AI, and misinformation. What do you say? Best mm. Rick B. Oh so, boy! So he's saying he's saying what is it that's gonna <laughs> that's gonna end yeah. our signal? Yeah, and how long can we keep it going? Oh, we we must be putting out. Is SETI putting out a signal? Is SETI just like is SETI? Didn't we? What's yeah. the thing on the? Is it on Voyager that like plate that has like the sort of oh, engraved like, stuff? Right? Isn't that Voyager yes. that's sent yeah. out? I think I think almost everything they send out now has some sort of time capsule information really? like songs and poems and stuff yeah and like a three musketeers bar and like some kind of just like <laughs> yeah, just twinkies. <laughs> twinkies twinkies <laughs> twinkies twinkies <laughs> twinkies <laughs> yeah, yep it would be twinkies did you ever hear that no, just here's a real side you ever i one time heard that you know because twinkies are this thing that supposedly don't need to be cooked it's just the combination of chemicals <laughs> cooks them that they there's no cooking it required lasts forever yes and then i once heard and i don't know if this is true and i'll get back to the letter in a second that in the Twinkie factory where they're making the Twinkies, people get Twinkie lung because they Come inhale on. these chemicals <laughs> and, it, and, it, and it cooks and it creates a, a coating of, of, Twinkie, <laughs> of Twinkie matter inside your lungs. It's I don't horrible. know if it's true. Yeah, it's, it's, like black, it's like black lung for coal miners. <laughs> oh they get Twinkie God. lung. I don't know if it's true or not, but I remember hearing that. Well, anyway. it should preserve them for, for a very long time. Yes. It's like your whole inside of your lung is like microplastics, like a yes, layer. Yes, exactly. Of, That's exactly Jesus right, except Christ. it's clinky. It's Twinkie cake <laughs> inside of your head. It's like, um, but okay, so he's saying, right, what's now there? Who He's saying 50 years, 50 years from now, and it will end because we're going to be done in by one of these things. Yeah, like I think politicians proposed. could could wipe us all out by just blowing yeah. us all up. Could, well, that nuke, certainly seems ourselves. like an increasing policy, uh, increasing yeah. probability, right? I mean, that, that doomsday clock thing, have you been yeah. reading about that recently? That's right. I guess it's the closest to midnight it's ever been in the past few years, right? It's scary. It's really um, scary. It's really scary because, I mean, now they're not – you know, they're these little warhead things. You can just lob one of those really easily. It's not yep. like you're, you know, not like you got to fly the Enola Gay over a thing and drop this, I drop know. Fat Boy and Little Man out of a, <laughs> you know, out of a thing. Jesus. You got to like, Fat <laughs> Boy, know, right? Isn't it Fat Boy yeah, and Little Man? I think it was. <laughs> and you know, you got to like, you can just toss one of these things. You know, yeah. not a big deal. And so that to me seems like the most likely thing, doesn't it? I mean, but do you think you know? Let's imagine there is like a, a, a nuclear holocaust of some kind. Okay, we're getting dark here, but I know. But I have this feeling that there's going to be, and maybe it's because I've watched too much science fiction films. But there's going to be some small cadre that goes underground. They're there mm -hmm. now. They've got silos and shit. They're going to yes. still like they're all billionaires. They're all trillionaires. Yeah, right. This is yeah. what I'm saying. Like yeah. these guys, like Elon. Yeah, Musk, I don't know that it will end it. Yeah, yeah, what you're saying is I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, and that's the thing is that I don't know. Man, man is a resilient beast. <laughs> God bless him. And, you know, it's like, I mean, all of this, you're like, what really, what could, it doesn't, it seems to me like it would certainly go beyond 50 years. I mean, even if I we had so a- I think so too. Yeah, I think 10,000 years sounds 
possible. More likely. It seems possible. Yeah. I mean, it seems like it. Because even if we mess up the planet really bad, we'll live in domes or, or whatever. underground. We'll live, yeah. well, man, we'll live off planet or something. I mean, 10,000 years. If we make it 10,000 years, surely we'll make it a little further than that. Right? I mean, it's like, if we can make What's it What's that great song? In the year 2525. In the year 2525, <laughs> if man is still alive. Who is classic? that? Classic. I don't know. It's so classic. Who was that? God. Oh, well, that's it sounds boy. like Burl Ives, but I don't think it's It Burl. wasn't Burl Ives. No, it was more <laughs> like, uh, it was some kind of... Uh, you know, trippy psychedelic band. It yeah. was like, you know, Strawberry Alarm Clock or something. You know, was it, wasn't there a band? Wasn't there a band called something like yeah, that? Yeah, there was. Or like, you know, Three Dog Night or something like that. It just feels like one of those things. Um, yeah, I mean, but what would be this AI? But I don't well, feel if you like could, if AI is going to take over, I don't know why AI wouldn't continue to probably... To send signals. Send yeah. signals. So it's like, you know, I don't think they're going to end anything. You know, and and if you if there's this theory that uh, there if a civilization got really sophisticated, it would create what they call a Dyson Dyson sphere, mm -hmm. and the Dyson sphere, which is named after Freeman Dyson, the physicist, is that we could create some kind of structure that would harness the power of the sun, mm -hmm. and then be able to use that power like a giant battery, mm -hmm. and so people suggest that if a civilization can do that, it would leave a pretty big like a fingerprint mm -hmm. to be seen, like some kind of evidence. You'd see that, you know, a galaxy away. Right. And so humans might be able to create some kind of giant sort of mirror type. Of course, one theory is we should just shut up. We should be very quiet. So we Why? Don't get because detected. you don't want to invite some dude to come and exactly. destroy the planet. You believe that there's intelligent life elsewhere or life I, I do yeah and I, do. I think the probability life. is there I right it just seems too it seems too weird that this would be the only place right yeah um that's my view yeah I think we brought this didn't we bring this up with somebody in one of these where I, I was, we were in a live show and I thought we were talking about this in a live I show feel like too. too and I think I was going about that thing that I was always saying when I was a kid which was well nothing you know Paul nothing can live on Venus because there's too much methane and I was like well, what about a thing that lives on methane? You know, and everybody, <laughs> yes, yeah. right. and I'm like, you know, why do we know? I mean, the definition of life just seems, you know, as we define it, biological life, you know, obviously yeah. methane, we kill everything. But, you know, I suppose it doesn't make any sense. Life is resilient make. and very strategic. Uh, yeah. It can it can grow. And yeah, I think that, I mean, there's there's one theory that says like, you need more time uh, than we have to, like, cause if you look at the, the earth, the, if it's only been around for what, I don't know how many, like 4 billion years or something, something like, like that. that. Yeah. yeah. And earth's been around for like three, or, I'm sorry, life has been around for 3 billion years, mm -hmm. but it was basically like algae, like soup for most of that time. Crazy. And then they think we're only going to maybe get another billion years before the sun gets so hot that it boils the ocean. Is that right? Is that how much yeah. we have is a billion years well, and I've then the sun that, expands yeah. and yeah, right. As the sun goes super, no, the sun goes red giant and all that stuff. It like well, but I guess like that's like ten million. That's ten billion years, but it, but ah, just okay. one billion years might it's make getting the hot Earth enough. uninhabitable. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh wow. So okay. the the window of opportunity for an intelligent technological expansion is actually more narrow than we thought it was. If the Earth is a good example. Wow, that's a trip to think of. Holy cow. Oh man, there's a really good. It just made me when you were saying resilient life. I reread recently a really good science fiction book, a weird science fiction book, and actually not an easy science fiction book to read called Dragon's Egg. Oh, what was it? A Dragon's Egg, it's called. And I can't remember the name of the guy who wrote it, but he's a physicist, which doesn't lend itself to being great. <laughs> Great literature. <laughs> well, no, but it makes itself being good science fiction. Yes. It doesn't lend itself to be great literature. I mean, he's not the greatest writer no in the world. No character development. Guy, yeah, he's not the greatest writer in the world. But but it's an interesting book about life developing on a neutron star, which is you know these these uh, as stars collapse, 
in as they're dying, the neutron star is, I guess, the step before a black hole, right? Before oh. it sort of like collapses in on itself. So it's this super dense. And there's dense, like white dwarf too. Is yeah, white stage. dwarf and stuff like that. And so it's like this super dense star. So these, this crazy civilization develops on the surface of a neutron star that is like, it's like flatland or something. Oh, you know, cool. It's like, because they're so really flattened cool. to the, yeah. So, but it's really, it's kind of great because there's sort of elaborate, civilization grows up and there's a fantastic first contact story in it too with these guys make contact with these kind of almost microscopic things that are living on the surface of wow. this it's a good book yeah it's good but the idea that something could live in that kind of place you know yeah. I mean, in these in these environments that we'd think it would be impossible for something to live i mean the fucking fish that live at the bottom of the crazy yeah those Exactly, those volcanic you know? holes yeah. at the bottom of the sea. Yeah. And then there's like animals living down there that were, yeah. you know, just astounding. Fuck, the fact that we fucking have made it this far, that we exist at all have made it this it's far. True. You know? It's true. But I think that's true. Like whenever people uh, create uh, science fiction narratives, they always sort of make them look humanoid. And yes. they wouldn't look humanoid at all. No, They'd look, no. like you said, single cells or yeah, spiders something, or something. something. Yes, or whatever. Not even anything we could conceive of. Yeah. Which is really a cool idea. Like something yeah. inconceivably weird looking. So or alien. Like a, that's what like that, that Stanislaw Lem idea in Solaris is the whole planet could be a conscious being. Right. That's fucking, that's really cool. That's really trippy. The yeah. entire thing is a yeah. sort of conscious being. And it's power. It, it's such, so powerful that it, it kind of, it kind of invades and takes over other people's consciousness. Yes. Too. And that right. thing, because it's sort of just, it's pure consciousness. So it just yeah. leaks into anything else conscious around it, which is really, Jesus Christ. <laughs> It's kind of creepy when you think about it. <laughs> it's really creepy. Yeah, it's super creepy, actually. It's a very creepy concept. Wow. Well, there you go. Okay, Rick. That was something, Rick B. Well done, Rick. I like that one. That was cool. Yeah, I've never heard of cool. the Drake. Yeah, that was really cool. Uh, keep them coming. Keep them rolling in because it's uh, always a good time. Yeah. Uh, always uh, inspiring. And uh, as always, uh, chin waggers. Wag on. <laughs> nice. Chinwag is a production of Tree Fort Media and Touchy Feely Films, hosted and executive produced by Paul Giamatti and Stephen Asma. Executive producers for Tree Fort are Kelly Garner and Lisa Ammerman. Dan Carey is executive producer for Touchy Feely. Our series producer is Rachel Whitley Bernstein. Original theme music by Luke Topp, with additional music by Via Mardot. Oscar Guido is our executive in charge of production. Tom Monahan is head of audio for Tree Fort. Audio production supervision by Matt Dyson. Editing and mixing by Jeff Neal. Animation created by Alex Sokol. Research assistance by Aiden Brooks. Lastly, for more information, go to chinwagpod.fm and find us on Instagram or TikTok at chinwagpod or on Twitter at chinwag underscore pod. <laughs>